Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm not a professor. I don't have a coat because my wife can't stand the aggressive air conditioning here in Florida. <laughs> She's wearing it. I'd like you to help us and, and consider a third major footprint for the Muses Institute in advancing liberty. And when I say that, I think of the first one as the academic economics project, so presciently started by Lou 30 odd years ago and led by Dr. Salerno and has made such fantastic progress as these gentlemen can attest to. The second is the libertarian project, which is all of us, right, trying to advance libertarian thought and libertarian principles in every way that we can. We think there's a possibility for another very large audience, and that's the business audience. So we've started a project called Economics for Business, and the idea is to build that big footprint in the business world, thinking of everybody in business, from an individual contractor to a large corporation, anybody involved in entrepreneurship, which is the creation of new value for, for people. And we started out with the idea that we would Austrianize the business discipline, meaning in the universities, in business schools, and try to change that industrial age thinking about central control and, and top-down strategy and financial controls and substitute subjective value and consumer sovereignty and entrepreneurship. And we've made great, great progress there too, as, as these two professors and many others have established in their positions in business school. So we're making progress there. But then we said, hey, we can go further than that. We can Austrianize business practice. We can look at what we call the middle class of business, everybody except the giant corporations, any any business with an employee base of, of three to 500, that's our middle class of business, and expand the idea of, of Austrianism and Austrian economics there, focusing on customers first, on creating value, on entrepreneurship, and less of the, the central control and bureaucracy and, and so on that detracts from, from creating value. And then we said, we can go even further. We can build an entrepreneurial society. So going beyond business to think about the entrepreneurial ethic as one that we can imbue in the whole of society. And an entrepreneurial society would be characterized by value, Entrepreneurs create value for other people. They try to improve other people's lives. They get a reward from the marketplace for doing that. That's a great spirit for an entrepreneurial society. The tool for that is empathy. Understanding somebody else's thinking, somebody else's mentality, somebody else's need, and trying to meet that need. So that empathetic spirit is imbued in entrepreneurship. It's collaborative. All this insane thinking about competition as red in tooth and claw, I've got to kill you to get ahead, is 100% wrong. The entrepreneurial society is collaborative in trying to raise the, the benefits for everybody. Let's all figure out what's the best way to do this. It's a collaborative undertaking in, in society. It's ethical. Dr. Byland has written very convincingly about what he calls the ethic of entrepreneurship. It's a service ethic. That's, that, that would be the way that an entrepreneurial society would think. It would have low time preference. And that Dr. Hoppe says that's the, the one prime need of civilization is developing the low time preference. And that's what entrepreneurs do. They take time to find out what customers need. They take time to build the production capability to deliver on that need and they get their reward sometime in the future. They sacrifice the present in order, for, uh, in order to build a, a better future. And so we have that, that low time preference. It's creative, it's, it's creating new ideas, new thoughts, innovations, and so on, and it's apolitical. 
Entrepreneurs have no time for politics. They're trying to build businesses. So this idea comes right from our very core. It comes from human action. And you could pick many quotes out of human action to, uh, to capture the thought. One of the quotes that we all like and we quote a lot is from Ludwig von Mises talk, talking about entrepreneurship as the driving force, the driving force of the market society. And the market society is what we're talking about, the free market without intervention, without coercion, without government control, the driving force. So if we can develop entrepreneurship in that sense, we will we'll create a wonderful society. And in fact, another quote that's a particular favorite of mine is from Dr. Jesus Huerta de Soto, who said this, the fairest society is the one which most energetically promotes the entrepreneurial creativity of all its members. That's from uh, an essay called The Theory of Dynamic Efficiency, which I recommend to you all if you haven't, haven't read, read it. So think of a couple of words in that. Fairest. We can own the idea of fair. We can own justice. And his way of defining that is to say that we have private property, and if the society is fair, it will enable us to use our private property to serve others and to get the market reward for doing so and to keep that reward. That's, that's the fairness. It's the anti-redistributive uh, kind of approach. Entrepreneurial creativity of all its members, we're all creative. We all have ideas, we all have thoughts, we all have that, that, that kind of capability. And so that's the, the vision of the entrepreneurial society. And so we're with the Economics for Business project, we're trying to create a kind of infrastructure for that. And we're trying to change an orientation. So instead of being uh, dependent, instead of being submissive, the orientation would be much more of this creativity and this, this serving others, self-reliance, and the ability to, to create and build. There's three principles for doing that. There's knowledge. And obviously, the Mises Institute has all the knowledge in the world about Austrian economics and how we can apply that and how to build businesses and how to build entrepreneurship and how to be creative. We've tried to add some tools. Here's how to do this. Here's where to start. Here's the next step and, and so on. We're building those tools and a lot of potential for those and build a community in the business world of people getting together and trying to raise the spirit of entrepreneurship. Have you tried this? Have you done that? I've got this problem. Help me out. We'll build that, that community. So I'm hoping that I can show a video now of the current state of our website. Welcome, fellow Mises Institute supporters. Those of you here today, as well as those who are joining us online, I'm Ricky Porco, and today I'm going to take you on a quick tour of the Economics for Business platform. The goal for our project is to Austrianize the entrepreneurial journey. We want to enable people in all realms of business to be more entrepreneurial and especially more Austrian. To do that, we're bringing knowledge, tools, and community together under one Austrian economics powered umbrella, the E4B platform. Our approach centers around the entrepreneurial GPS, or eGPS as we call it, a proprietary structure we've created to help organize the entrepreneurial journey and all of the activities, skills, and knowledge contained within. It's five stages from imagination to management and growth, and it's designed to get people oriented within our library of entrepreneurial content and to better match them with the right tools, information, or people that might help them achieve specific goals. Each stage of the eGPS has its own page on the platform where various types of content like videos, tools, podcasts, research papers, and others are aggregated in order to give the entrepreneur a focused view of resources that are available to them and might be valuable to them at this particular moment in time. Platform users can recalibrate their eGPS so that each time they log into the platform, they're met with a new opportunity to discover tools and content tailored to their stage in the entrepreneurial journey. And our premise is very action-oriented, so we emphasize actionable tools every chance we can on the platform. We also highlight the individuals who helped create these tools. 
One of the ways is with profiles that invite opportunity for connection and mentorship. And it also gives tool and content creators the ability to showcase their contributions to our Economics for Business library. So thanks for taking a quick tour of Economics for Business with me. If you're interested in hearing more about the platform or joining our beta test, shoot me an email at ricky at mises.org and we'll get you added to the list. Thanks again, fellow Institute supporters. That was Ricky Porco, who's been one of our tremendous uh, supporters in helping us build this. I want to mention Wesley Downs, who is the project leader at, uh, at, at the Mises Institute in, in helping us build this. Um, it's in beta test right now, and we, we hope to get it ready for full distribution very quickly. So I've used my 10 minutes. I'm going to hand over to my good friend, Pierre, right? Does he Nate, or is Peter next? I, I can go. I got the mic. First, I, I want to thank Hunter uh, and acknowledge his fantastic leadership in being the driving force behind this project, uh, which is so important, not only for helping entrepreneurs be better entrepreneurs, but also for, in, in ways that are both explicit and also more implicit and subtle, promoting the great message of liberty and freedom that unites you know, all of us uh, here, here this weekend. I just want to touch on that point a little bit. So, uh, you know, if, if you ask, in what ways can entrepreneurship promote liberty and a better society, improvements in human well-being, and so forth? Well, I mean, the the more obvious way is the practical one. The practice of entrepreneurship, of course, involves, as as Mises said, uh, you know, producing uh, entrepreneurs creating producing, uh, distributing goods and services to the market that improve consumer well-being. I mean, that's what entrepreneurs do. They compete against each other, cooperating with other people throughout the supply chain and so forth to create value, to combine and recombine productive factors, resources, you know, in a world of uncertainty and positive time preference and so forth to uh, produce goods and services that consumers will buy. Right? So we're all made better off, of course, by entrepreneurship being done and being done well. Clearly, there's a role for the Austrian school and the Mises community to help entrepreneurs do what they do better. You know, there's also something that it, it, we hear about a lot today is the notion that, you know, how do we deal with all these horrible problems that we're talking about? What's our strategy for making the world a better place? Aside from entrepreneurs just being entrepreneurs in general, you also hear a lot about entrepreneurship as a way of creating sort of parallel or alternative structures, institutions, networks, organizations that allow us to bypass, at least partially, the, the unjust, inefficient, you know, oppressive institutions uh, that, we, that we have in our world today. We just heard in the previous panel about education. Right, so we can try to reform the existing universities, including the state-owned, state-subsidized universities, or we can try to create our, our own set of educational institutions. The Mises Institute, of course, is one of those. I view Lou Rockwell as one of the great intellectual entrepreneurs of the last, I don't know, 50 years, right, in creating an organization that does education and outreach and supports research and so forth. You might think about, you know... Uh, Sure, there are plenty of people in the room who are who are into crypto, right? You can think of crypto as a private, commercial sort of free market alternative to the existing you know, part of the financial system and ways that we can write and execute smart contracts and so forth, right? So, in lots of different sectors, you can say, well, if we can't reform, you know, the legal system, we can create our own private alternatives through the practice of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs are doing exactly that. So that's one reason to be optimistic about the role of entrepreneurship in promoting liberty, freedom, and a better society. There's another aspect of this too, however, which is more of an education and outreach mission. So um, I teach entrepreneurship at a university, at Baylor University. I, I, I bet Pear, who also teaches entrepreneurship at Oklahoma State, feels the same way. Um, we, we have 
lots of students in our programs. We have a major in entrepreneurship. Lots of students are taking those classes, uh, pursuing that major because they want to learn how to be better entrepreneurs. They want to be more successful in their chosen uh, line of work. They want to be the next Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, you know, fill in the blank. Fantastic. We're delighted to have those students in our courses participating in our programs. However, Probably, you know, not that many students, and the, the data suggests that only a small number of students actually, you know, start a, a, a successful venture while they're in school or even within a few years out of school. In the U.S., it's mostly older people, it's mostly middle-aged people who are successful first-time entrepreneurs and successful serial entrepreneurs. So, you know, why do we have all these programs and courses? Well, I have often advocated, though I haven't yet been successful, uh, making an entrepreneurship course be a requirement for every student at the university. People say, well, why do you need that? I mean, what about the ones who are going to you know, work for a big corporation? Or what about the ones who want to go to law school or whatever? Look, you know, it, it, to, to get a well-rounded education and traditional liberal arts education, everyone has to take a course in music appreciation, Right? Even if you're not a professional musician, even if you're not a concert pianist or a rock and roll star or whatever, you, know, you should know who Mozart was. You should know what, why Beethoven is considered a great composer. I, I, nowadays, I guess you should know who Nobel laureate Bob Dylan was right, and so forth. You know, to be a well-educated person, your life will be better if you understand what music is, how it works. A little bit about music theory and notes and scales. A little bit about music history. You know, kind of a, a way to make you understand and appreciate the value of music, even if you yourself are not a producer of music. Even if you can't sing a lick, you should still know something about it. In my view, entrepreneurship is the same way. Everyone should take a course in entrepreneurship appreciation so that they understand what entrepreneurs do, why entrepreneurship is so important in a free society. You know, exactly what, what why, how is it that entrepreneurs, as we're discussing, you know, are creating products and services and alternative institutions, you know, to, to make our lives better. That way people will be better informed They'll be able to think clearly about, more clearly about policy, right? When we think about all the things that government does to make entrepreneurship more difficult, to hinder and stymie innovators and creators and disruptors and so forth, it would be easier to get support for better policies, you know, leaving entrepreneurs alone, if people understood that entrepreneurship is the driving force and you better not mess it up, right? How does that relate to our platform? Well, look, we're getting practical people to think more about the kind of underpinnings and wait a minute this website really helped me solve some problem that my business had who did you say you people were again what is this mizey me me what mises what is that what is austrian australian you know what is it what, what does that mean we we get them you know we sort of draw them in to thinking about sort of this this worldview and even you know, to, the, the more that we can promote entrepreneurship as a positive good, you know, from there it's just one step further to say, oh, you like entrepreneurship? You know, you like the job that you have, the work that you do, or you appreciate the entrepreneurial innovation of somebody else? You want to keep that? Okay, well, no, let us explain what kind of, you know, policies and institutions and mindset, ways of thinking are necessary for us to keep it. Right, you know, there, there's that famous line. This is a, this is a Patrick Newman. This is a Patrick Newman thing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, was was it? Now I've forgotten. Was it was it Jefferson or no? I think it was. Uh, I think it was Ben Franklin. You know, famously asked by some constituent or some community member after the Constitutional Convention. You know, what what have you what have you guys done? What have you created for us? What have you made? And his answer, I guess, is probably something that is attributed to him, but maybe it's like you know that. Abraham Lincoln quote, you know, don't believe everything you read on the internet, signed Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the, the famous line is, you know, we've given you, what, what we have now is a republic if you can keep it. Okay, you know, we can argue about whether it really was a republic because it didn't take long for it to turn into an empire. But the point is, you know, entrepreneurs are giving you an entrepreneurial market society, but we've got to keep it. We've got to not destroy it. 
right? Which is what many of the people in power would like to do. So the more we can get everyone thinking about understanding, being excited about entrepreneurship, the better we as a society will be. And I think this platform goes a long way uh, in you know, pushing us toward that goal. So I wanted to direct your attention to the title of this um, panel. It's not entrepreneurship and the state, and it's not entrepreneurship with the state. It's not even entrepreneurship despite the state. It's entrepreneurship versus the state. Okay, and there's a reason for that, because entrepreneurship is a good means, and I'll get back to this in my talk this afternoon, for how to get rid of, or rather, smash the state, and doing it bottom up. So what I mean by that is that I, I typically think of entrepreneurship as, or entrepreneurs, as those who create our tomorrow. They're in the business of creating the products and services, as Peter mentioned, and also the solutions and really the structure of society tomorrow. What tomorrow looks like is what entrepreneurs feel like creating for us. And what is successful is what we respond to, but we don't actually know what we want until we see it. And Henry Ford, I'm also going to use a quote that it was never actually said, uh, <clears throat> just like Peter and Patrick. Uh, Henry Ford never said uh, that had I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. He didn't produce faster horses because he realized that they would probably be better off with something else, an automobile. Okay, so Instead, he followed his own vision and he ma imagined a better future than consumers were able to imagine. So Henry Ford and all the other entrepreneurs, they're in the business of creating our tomorrow. The state is different. The state is in the business of destroying our past. Right, so everything we did in the past, everything entrepreneurs created in the past, that's what the state is involved in destroying. And then we can see the difference and the contrast and why entrepreneurship is the means to, under, to undermine and smash the state. They're completely opposites. So it's obvious to me as an Austrian that entrepreneurship is, is what we need to understand, is what we need to teach, is also what we need to practice to get rid of the state. It's that simple. <laughs>